So we're going to now look at uh, the next verse here. Here is Satan, the accuser, comes into the presence of God with all the other angels. The Lord then said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, I've come from roaming out throughout the earth, you know, minding my own business and causing lots of trouble. <laughs> I've come from roaming about the earth, going back and forth and back and forth across the earth. So then the Lord said to him, please note, the Lord initiates the conversation. Satan didn't come with accusations to start with. The Lord initiates this conversation in the throne room. His sovereign over what is about to take place. The book of Job is one of the most intense dramas in the Bible. It is one of, I would not wish upon any human being what is about to happen to Job. I would not wish it upon anyone, but God initiates this. <clears throat> You've got to understand, as we saw from Daniel chapter 7, the one who is seated on the throne is the Ancient of Days and is full of eternal wisdom. And our wisdom is locked into what happens in this life, in this world. But God has a wisdom that's eternal, unlimited. And He sees beyond this life into eternity what is going to happen to the people that we see in life's drama. With all these different things happening, God sees the eternal perspective. He has an eternal agenda and He's wise in His agenda. Even for Job, Job saw the end of the story before the beginning started. Okay, we just see the beginning or the middle of the story. We've got to see the end. And by the way, I read the, I read the book and, and at the end of history, we win. You know, no matter what happens in the earth, no matter what testings, the people of God, the saints of God, we win. Because Jesus wins. Just something for you to know. So, so the Lord initiates a conversation. Where have you been? I've been going back and forth, back and forth upon the earth. So then the Lord says to Satan, um, Have you considered my servant Job? Have you noticed Job? Now, if that was me, like uh, I would say, say, Lord, do not mention my name. You know, <laughs> Satan, did you. Have you noticed Glenn Vines? It's like, shh. <laughs> Don't draw his attention to me. What are you doing, God? But God's all wise. That's a reason. His wisdom is foolishness to men. In fact, I think his wisdom is sometimes terrifying to us. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? But God's good. Yes. This is the thing, is the accuser... Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll read a bit further. I've got another point to make, but I'll read a bit further. Have you considered my servant Job? So God is initiating the conversation and God is actually pointing Satan's attention to Job. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. He is a man who fears God and he shuns evil. Does Job really fear God for nothing? Satan replies. Is it for nothing that he fears God? Is it for nothing that he's walking in righteousness? Have you not put a hedge of protection around him and around his household and around everything that he has? Here's Satan talking to God. You placed a hedge of protection around Job, around his family. Around his possessions. Me and my demonic henchmen can't touch him. Because your protection is all around Job. No wonder he's good. Because you bless him all the time. Everything goes good. It's easy to be righteous and holy and upright when everything's going good. You bless the works of his hands. 
so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. You bless his business. You bless his family. You bless his children. You're blessing his finances. You're blessing his health. No wonder he's good and righteous and fears and honours you because you give him good stuff. But if you would stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, he will surely curse you to your face, God. If you'd remove your protection, if you would strike him, then he'd start cursing you. Then you'd see that he's not really a man that fears you. Then you would see that he's not really someone who is truly righteous and holy in his heart. He's only like this because everything's going good for him. Let things not go good and you'll find out who he really is. So then the Lord said to Satan, very well. Everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So then what happens now is God has removed that hedge of protection from Job's family, from his possessions, uh, from himself, from his finances. And he's given now Satan authority, but he's limited the authority of what Satan is about to do. This is very important. There is a limit. God has set the boundaries. Satan, you can go and do this and this and thus and thus, but you cannot do this. You can strike his family, you can strike his possessions, but you cannot touch him. Okay? So God is still sovereign over what's happening here. God has set boundaries. <clears throat> so what does happen is, as Satan goes forth and he strikes Job's family, his children, Job's children are all killed in one day. All of his children, sons and daughters. Job's possessions are struck. Uh, thieves come and plunder his possessions. And uh, he loses servants. He loses his possessions. It's like your bank account, suddenly everything disappears. You know, Your house burns down. Your kids were in the house. They burned down with the house. This is all going on in Job's life. It's like everything bad that could ever happen has happened. This brings us to chapter 2. Job, in the midst of this, refuses to curse God, even though his wife is tempting him to do it later on. His wife is, gets all bitter out of this. His wife says, Job, curse God and die. And Job refuses to listen to the voice of his wife. Praise God. Those around us in the midst of the testing, there will be many voices. <coughs> But Job refuses to curse God. He refuses to listen to his own wife as she starts cursing God. The second test. On another day, the, the sons of God came again to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the troublemaker, turned up again. Anyway, I'll just put that troublemaker bit in there. And Satan also came with them to present himself before God. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, I've come from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth and back and forth. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless. He's upright. He's a man who fears God and he shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. Skin for skin, Satan says. A man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and strike his bones. And he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well. He's in your hands. But you must spare his life. Again, God says you can strike his body with sickness. Even his bones can be struck with sickness. But you cannot touch his life. There's a boundary on what is happening here. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and he afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And it goes on. His, his body was inflicted with great 
sickness and even internally his body was weak and sick and in pain. And throughout this, Job has many questions that he brings forth. He's, there's a whole drama. The book of Job's a long book, very detailed, about why righteous people suffer. That's the question. Why does God allow suffering? Why do righteous people suffer? And, uh, but at the end of the day, Job makes a statement, one of my favorite statements in the Bible. You know, though he kill me, I will still hope in him. Mm. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Talk about powerful hope. Even though he would kill me, I will not stop hoping in him. Mm. The incredible uh, tenacity of faith mm. in the midst of great suffering. So the point I want to make about this is Satan as the accuser is not just accusing Job before the throne of God. He's actually accusing God. He's saying, God, you are not really righteous. Because the way you're dealing with Job, you know, if you dealt with everybody like how you deal with Job, they'd all fear you and they'd all love you. And you're not righteous, actually, because I know deep inside his heart, he is not really a man of faith. He's not really a man who fears God. I know what's really in his heart, and you don't. And this is the thing, is the accusations, what's going on here is not just to clear the name of Joab, but is to prove that God is truly righteous in how he deals with every human being. So... um. What I want us to look at now, Psalm 89. <clears throat> Can I also say that at the end of a very intense story, where Joab suffers intensely, at the end, Joab passes the test, God restores him, restores his marriage, and obviously he doesn't get back his sons and daughters who have perished, but he restores to him sons and daughters and flocks and things, and he has more than he had before the test started. Um, so Joab passes this test. So in Psalm 89, we'll start with verse 5 through to 8. It says, The heavens praise your wonders, O God, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. Now the assembly of the holy ones is what we're talking about, the counsel of God. This is the assembly of the holy ones. Um, this is where it says, uh, the gods assemble. We'll look at that terminology later. For who in the skies above, and that word for skies is heavens as well. It can be translated, who in the heavens above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord amongst the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround Him. O Lord God Almighty. In fact, it's O Lord God of hosts. Who is like you? You're mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. And it's describing the courtrooms of heaven. It's describing that around Him are the holy ones, the heavenly beings. None of them are like the Lord our God. In fact, in His presence, that they fear Him. They're in awe of Him. They know who He is. James, the brother of Jesus, in the book of James, says, The demons believe and they tremble. The demons know who God is and they tremble because it's not a redemptive salvation thing for them in faith. It's, the demons cannot get saved. They're finished. The fallen angels, of which Lucifer is one, Satan, is a fallen angel. Um, really before the throne of God, they know who God is. Even though, because of pride, he has all sorts of sneaky schemes and strategies. Now, 
Let's uh, have a look at uh, Psalm 82 verse 1. We've got to know who God is in the midst of the temptation. We've got to know who God is in the midst of the crisis. We've got to see who God is on His throne because if all we see is the, what's going on in the earth and what's going on in the second heaven, the second heaven is where angels and demons are in constant warfare. You know, the first heaven is around the earth, the atmosphere around the earth. The second heaven, angels and demons are warring and pushing back and forth. But in the throne room of God, God's on His throne unchallenged. You know, no one can really challenge who God is. So Psalm 82 verse 1 says, God presides in the great assembly. Again, it's describing the heavenly council, the throne room of God. He gives judgment amongst the gods. Please note that. He gives judgment amongst the gods. Um, now, I'll explain something to you. Uh, originally, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and, and also Aramaic was used. The Hebrew language. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek. In the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, the, the Greek Empire had control uh, over the uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine area, or the area of Israel. And also, from times going back to the Babylonians, uh, many of the Jewish people had been scattered throughout the nations, uh, ancient Babylon and Persia. And, um, and as they got scattered over the nations, they lost their uh, understanding of the Hebrew language. And the, the, the language of the ancient world was Greek. And so in order, of, because they're losing their understanding of the Hebrew language, and some might be able to speak a bit of it, but they couldn't read and write it, they were taught to read and write Greek. And so um, in ancient times, they, what they did is they started translating the Old Testament into the Greek language so that the, the Jewish people scattered all over, including those in Israel, were mainly now reading and writing Greek. Um, so they, they now write it in Greek so that they can study the Word of God in a language that they can understand. Now, this is the original Hebrew Old Testament. This is the New Testament that was written in Greek, and, and I've studied this. Even the book of Hebrews was written in Greek. This is really interesting. The book of Hebrews was written to Messianic Jews, and it's written in Greek. Now, the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. All of these Hebrew concepts were translated into Greek language in the Greek Old Testament. The Greek Old Testament now becomes a bridge to understand the Hebrew root concepts with the New Testament words. Because you can literally see the Hebrew words that are being used, how they translate in the Old Testament into Greek, and then what words are used in the New Testament in Greek. Are you understanding this? Okay, for example, we had a psalm that we declared this morning. And Psalm 111. And we kept saying, His love endures forever. And it was kind of strange. Because he's killing the kings, you know. Pharaoh and his army are, are wiped out in, in, in the Red Sea and they're destroyed and his love endures forever. And then he strikes down that king and destroys his love endures forever. You know? And some Bibles say his mercy endures forever, and it's like that's even more weird. Kills his people. And his love endures forever. Okay. Because the Hebrew word originally used is Hased. Hased is not translated as love or mercy. Hased is covenant faithfulness. It's being faithful to the covenant. That's why God is destroying the enemies of Israel, because of his covenant faithfulness to Israel. He destroyed Pharaoh and Pharaoh's armies because God has a covenant with the Israelites. And Pharaoh was trying to destroy the Israelites and enslave them. And because God is faithful to his covenant and his covenant love to Israel caused him to destroy their enemies. Now I'm saying this because when they translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, the word has said is translated agape. So whenever you read the New Testament, it says God is love. 
God is agape, is saying God is a hased, God. He's a God of covenant faithfulness. So I'm explaining that for a reason now because we're in <coughs> Psalm 82. God presides in the great assembly and he gives judgment amongst the gods. Okay, now in the days of Jesus, he quotes the end of this psalm when he's talking to the Pharisees. Because so, verse 6, I said, you are gods. You're all God, sons of the Most High, but you're going to die like mere men. You're going to fall like every other ruler. So here's this word, gods. Jesus quotes it to the Pharisees because Jesus said he's, a, he's the, the son of God. And they said, you're claiming to be God. And he said, well, anyway, even the ancient psalmist, he said, you are gods. And it's talking about the rulers and the judges of Israel were called gods. Okay? So we're going to understand the word in the Hebrew that's used here is Elohim. Elohim. Now, there's a number of names used for God in the Old Testament. The original name used for our God is Elohim. And then later, uh, Adonai. And then Yahweh, or Jehovah, depending on how you want to pronounce that. Yahweh is most likely the most accurate way of saying it. So there was, whenever we read in the Bible and it says God or Lord, it's either Elohim, Adonai, or Yahweh. Okay? The word that's used here is Elohim. But Elohim was not just used for our God, Yahweh. Elohim was used for the gods. Okay, so you've got big God, big G God, Yahweh. And you'll notice in Bibles it writes a big G when it's like Yahweh or Adonai or our God. But it will put little G, God, 